So the goal here is to build an audience and attract followers and try to connect for results. Because it's very easy to attract an audience. If you look at a lot of the clickbait stuff that's out there, the buzz feeds, the headlines, that's very easy to make a lot of noise and very quickly get something noticed or to be controversial. But to keep those people loyal is very hard to get them to actually stay connected or keep coming back. So we're going to talk about some strategies to increase your reach using social media, talk about building a network to get the messages out, build an actual community, which is different than a network. So on a lot of the things that I run, we have separate communities for our most active users. For example, we have a community for Premiere Pro users on Facebook that we run that Adobe supports. I started it, it's up to about 5,000 members. The product team and several people participate, but it is a tightly managed and curated community. It has very clear rules posted like don't complain. It's okay to ask questions. This is not where you file feature request. Do not be rude. You know, it's fine, but don't get into a heated argument with the product manager who's in here checking in with people and asking questions and talking because this isn't the forum. This isn't where you go to complain. This is where people who need to use the product every day to get professional results can come and get clear answers from their colleagues and the product team. If you're rude, we will kick you out, just like I wouldn't let you be rude in my office. We maintain a professional decor. At, Fo at PhotoFocus, we have a fan page where people can like the magazine, but we also have a page where people can post their photographs and get critiques from each other. And we sample and take those photos and select them for our photo of the day, giving people a national audience or an international audience. And so we create a sense of more community. And there's a difference. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. The quest for likes, the quest for numbers, is not nearly as effective as having a more engaged audience that will do things for you. That when you ask them to do something or to spread the word or to take action or to raise money or to get involved, that's more important. So this is, should be suitable for all folks. Um, my background, I work where basically video and photography collide. I started my career as a journalist. Uh, I worked for a lot of news organizations, and then I decided to leave journalism when it first jumped the shark back in the mid-90s, and it became more about celebrity news, and don't even get me started about how awful I feel most journalism is today. Um, but I decided to go work in the private sector, and the bulk of our clients are uh, advocacy, educational, and uh, nonprofit groups. We have a few corporate clients and some for-profit things mixed in there too. It's not all altruism, but uh, that's what I do. And uh, in my spare time, when I have time, I teach or I document stuff and I put it out there. A lot of people incorrectly assume that all I do is teach. Uh, I do a lot of teaching, and fortunately, we've got a team of 39 people that work at my two companies, so it makes it very easy to publish a lot of stuff but it's not all about publishing. We actually are practitioners, we get hands-on, we work with real projects and clients. Uh, here's how you can get in touch if you need to. I'll put this back up at the end. I've got cards if you need it. And uh, let's jump forward. So one of the first things you have to do <coughs> is create some sort of identity. And this is important. This is either your identity as an individual or your identity as an organization you have to decide on who this person is. And here's the real thing. I'm incredibly introverted. When I'm at home with my wife, who's also an introvert, we're totally fine chilling and talking like every five or 10 minutes, someone will say something to the other person. It's not constant conversation. She goes all day and is a school teacher and has to talk nonstop. I have to talk nonstop. When given the choice, I actually prefer not to talk. But I'm good at talking, and I'm good at figuring things out, so I get asked to stand up. Online, I have, to be, I have to work hard at being personable. I hate email. When I respond to people online, I am incredibly brief to the point that I often offend people because of my brevity. They'll write like a two-page email, and I'll respond with two sentences. That's not how you make friends. But you have to have an identity online. So part of this here is I do not ever tell folks that I am a social media expert. I'm not. This is not my job. I am a content creator who has attracted a large audience. So what I'm going to share with you are things that I've screwed up and things that I've succeeded at. 
This doesn't mean that they will work for you in all cases. Every product, each of you has different needs of what you're trying to accomplish. So some of the things I say will work, some won't. So just remember that it's always trial and error. If it was a recipe that you followed, everybody's video would go viral. Everybody's organization would be setting records on Kickstarter. There are a lot of variables and luck involved. But we've published a website for 18 years. We've done something right. So I'm just using myself as an example. And this is kind of funny, but on social media, on most forums, I am a product. I'm the CEO of a company. My job is to pull in business to use our recording studios and to attract clients. I'm supposed to be a thought leader. So when I'm on Twitter, I'm not randomly tweeting about food most of the time. Every once in a while, I'll slip something in as a personal thing because it says, I'm a visual storyteller exploring the fusion of photography and video. I'm a husband and a father, and it names our two web properties, my main company and my, uh, my publishing company. So you will get some random stuff. And I might use Twitter to reach out to my network and say, I've boarded the plane and the choice between the three movies is this, this, and this. What should I watch? You know, I'll engage with people socially, but I'm not excessively talkative on Twitter. I see that most people on Twitter just want to get information out of me and want to know when I've published something useful. Half of all people on Twitter follow brands, much more than Facebook and other platforms. But they go to Twitter to get a streamlined news feed of links and recommended reading for stuff they're interested in. So use this like your own private newswire and then use it to respond to people who reach out to you or comment on your content. On Facebook, same bio, my Facebook page is very, I have two pages. I have a public page that anybody can follow that is all tech news. And my private page, I decided I originally was going to be not as techy, but most of my friends and a lot of people are interested in the same things that I'm interested in. But I tell my family how to filter stuff out, and I use it like a normal person. I limit it to about 600 friends. I don't keep it excessively busy. I figure if I have more than 600 people, I can't keep track of that many people. I can't actually respond or remember things about them. So I limit this to the people that are clients that I would choose to have a dinner with, not ones that you could go both agree on, let's order Chinese food and sit in the edit suite and eat the food, but the ones who at the end of a job you would want to go out and have a dinner with, your family, people you respect, past coworkers. These are people that I would consider colleagues and some family and friends worked in there. As such, my colleagues see pictures of my kids. They know that I'm a human being. A year and a half ago, when I got knocked down a flight of stairs and had to do eight months worth of rehab and tons of surgery to get back to walking and doing what I'm doing now, they tracked the progress. I was totally a human being on Facebook. They saw pictures of me going in for surgery. I'm a person because a lot of people forget that I'm a person. And the people that I do business with, simple adage I'm going to bring up later. When given the choice, people will do business with people they like and respect. You don't like and respect a brand. You like and respect people who embody the spirit or the vision of a brand. People connect with employees at companies that they feel a connection to. People don't connect with the brand outside of silly things like automobiles. On LinkedIn, I am a CEO. I publish only a handful of content. I keep my bio very up to date. I accept connections from just about anybody who works in my industry, as long as they don't have the words SEO specialist in their title line. And if they start trying to sell me SEO services or other things that I don't need, I usually say goodbye, unless they're a colleague or a friend I really know. That's not to bash on SEO. SEO is absolutely important, but I believe in tagging things. I believe in having genuine content with good tags and good labels and good descriptions so it can be found by the search engine, but I don't believe in playing SEO games to try to rig things. Have content properly indexed with good tags, good images, images that have proper file names. We'll talk more about that in the next class when we talk about SEO, but it's not a game. 
It's about content that's good, that's easy to find. So LinkedIn is where I connect to folks, and it's where I've got my most full bio. And they can tell I'm a bit of a nerd, right? I don't have a stuffy picture. I do have a geeky television background for what I'm interested in. Google Plus, Google Plus is a photography community. There are other people who use it, but really the only audiences that are deeply passionate on Google Plus is photographers. There's a disproportionate amount. And if you're not a targeting photographers, Google Plus is not that big of a deal. Google Hangouts are awesome. We're going to talk about Google Hangouts in our next session. Google Hangouts have been split off as its own product. Google has even given up on Google Plus. They've been splitting all the services back out of it. They pulled photos out into its own service. They pulled Google Hangouts out into its own service. So Google doesn't like being number four at anything. Okay, So we're clear. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest sometimes is up there. Google Plus is number five or number six at best. And when they say, look at all of our millions and billions of subscribers, it's because they made everybody who had a Gmail account or a YouTube account set up a Google Plus page. You can click over to Google Plus profiles and go nine out of 10 people who haven't posted anything for three months. So don't worry about it is what I'm telling you. All right. Let's, so does that give you an idea just as an individual how I present myself on different networks? And that's not the real me. I don't swear on social networks. I don't talk about politics. I don't talk about religion, usually. I avoid things that I would talk about with trusted friends and family because they have no business on a, a platform that could be screenshot. And don't delude yourself into thinking that these things are private. Some former person or anybody could take a screenshot and repost your content anywhere else. If it's on the internet, it is public. It might be less public, but it is public. Okay? All right, so what's the message you're going to send? Well, you have to decide on your personality. Are you a needy organization? Which is okay. If you are needy, if you need to raise funds, if you need to get active involvement, if you need to get support for a cause, well, then you need to be conveying what that need is and why it's important. And you have to beat people over the head. We've done fundraising for years for groups like the American Diabetes Association. We did the September 11th campaign for the American Red Cross. You cannot tell people enough what you do that's good, that helps people. People like scandal. People love to see well-respected things get effed up. People love a train wreck. So you have to be constantly reminding people about the good stuff you're doing and why you need their involvement. Uh, try not to do this, okay? This is not just telling everyone how awesome you are. If you have to tell people how awesome you are, you are not awesome. If you occasionally retweet or share customer testimonials or feedback or reply to somebody to make sure that their comment pops up in your feed, that's great. It's okay to share other people saying you're awesome, but don't tell people you're awesome. This one's hard. I have a very passive aggressive response to things. So, you know, every once in a while, okay, multiple times a day, people will reach out and tell me what they don't like about something we've done. You know, you didn't mention this brand camera in this article. You know, the, the intro to your podcast is too long. You know, there's too many ads on your podcast. You know, I, I really don't like that shirt you're wearing. Oh, it looks like you've put on some weight. Oh, you know, da 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 Just nonsense, right? My response is, I'm so sorry my free content offends you. That's about as passive aggressive as I get. <laughs> you know, what I'm trying to politely say is, Okay, if you would like to buy something from me, I am happy to let you be specific. Would you like to create a custom all-day training class for your employees? No problem. I'm three grand a day plus expenses. I do that about 40 times a year. It's great. TV stations hire me. I go in and I fix problems. I also do some for free for nonprofits. It's not all about money. Oh, you don't like my free tutorial? You think I should have did it a different way? Okay, great. God bless the internet. Search for something else. Move on. 
But you have to be very careful because no matter what happens, if you engage in a fight, you will always lose. The person you beat will tell everyone what a jackass you are, will screenshot it, will play up their victim status, and will go all over the place telling people how awful you are. Avoid it. Just ignore them. It's very hard, but ignore the trolls. Block them if you can. Make sure you come off as trustworthy. This one's difficult. If you're a nonprofit or you are an advocacy group, you have to manipulate people. I have to say this to a lot of my nonprofit clients all the time. Your job is to manipulate other people for their best interest. We're supposed to be doing a commercial about health. We have to scare people. We're supposed to be doing something about blood donations. We have to make somebody think about what would they do if it was their child in the car accident who needed the blood. We are manipulating people for their own best interest. You are all communications professionals. None of you told me that you were documentary people or that you were journalists. Journalists are not supposed to manipulate people. Documentary people are not supposed to manipulate the truth, though they, they do all the time by what they choose to keep and what they choose to discard. And journalists do the same thing, let's be honest, now more so than ever before. But you have to remember what your job is, and each of you has a job of some content that needs an audience, so it's your job to connect that. You want to be seen as sharing. And ideally, this, and this is the hard one, not everything that comes out of your mouth has to be incredible. But one out of 20 things needs to be pretty well thought out. Once a month, I try to sit down and write something that's truly personal, helpful, inspirational, well thought out, the sort of thing that, you know, if I were to take those 12 things and bundle them together and show those to my kids, this is what I do, this would be 12 examples, once a month, something important that I did. The rest of the stuff I put on the web is fodder. Good fodder, useful quick tips, helpful things, but not everything is epic. It only takes a little bit of epicness to be epic. The rest is fuel for the fire. Does that make sense? The spark, and then you need fuel to keep it going. So that's something to think about. Now, this presents a problem. You will have a moral dilemma of what do you share? My wife and I have had many a discussion. She's a little freaked out that 20,000 people look at my stuff on Twitter. She's happy with my approach to Facebook. She does not want me posting pictures of my kids to Twitter. I don't. On Facebook, where it's a controlled audience and my stuff is set to private and not to be shown to other people, she's okay with me being a person. We have like 100 friends that overlap, so she gets it. So. When I post to a, a creator's network, like 500 pics, I share photographs that are important to me. These are some of my favorite pictures, things that were meaningful to me, things that I like. I might share a picture of my child, you know, and have some fun. And it's a problem, right? Why am I doing this? Well, part of it is I'm proud. I'm a proud parent. Then you have to ask yourself, Am I using my life, my experiences, or my constituents to market? And unfortunately for most of us in the room, social media has turned our lives into marketing materials. Why do people post selfies? Self-marketing. I don't do a lot of selfies, but it's something to think about. So that's the moral dilemma that you'll have to balance out for yourself. So let's talk about process for a second. Before you open your mouth, listen and think. And this is critical advice that gets ignored every single day. If you learn nothing from this class, learn this advice. The process for social media. So the process, first off, is absolutely listen. You have to listen and get to know an audience. So if you join a group and you go ahead and you plug into that group, make sure that you actively listen to that group or you won't get good results. Okay? then you have to make sure that you are following. Once you start finding good people in that group, follow them. See where they go. 
See what other groups they belong to. Find the thought leaders and go see where they hang out. This is why I join so many different private groups on Facebook. Closed, moderated groups. There's a whole secondary Facebook to Facebook of people who don't care about other than connecting and interfacing with other professionals or other people who share their cause. Find some of those groups and join. Then curate your content. You can have great content on your site all the time through curation. PhotoFocus has usually four stories a day because we have a large author pool. We've got 25 writers. I take on the number of writers I need, so if everybody does three stories a month, we hit our quota of having four stories a day, plus what I want to write and what the other folks write. This way, we have enough content flowing through the pipeline to get the job done. We do three stories a day and a photo of the day. So with 25 writers, plus me and the original founder, we have articles all the time, so there's a constant feed of information. Then you try to help people by responding to questions, answering questions, get practice being responsive. Well before I started setting up my own websites, I was a very active member of Creative Cow, if any of you are familiar with that, an online community for video. For years, I helped people. and Some of the people that were fellow moderators are all out there in incredibly successful jobs. We learned how to listen and respond and open our mouths when we had something to say. Once you're done with that, then you move into original content. Too many people do this. I've written all this great stuff and nobody's coming to my website. The other thing you have to realize is it takes almost three months for a new website to actually work its way through search engines and to be properly easy to find. So you have to go through this stage of curation and responding and building and not put so much effort into original content. This doesn't say don't do original content. It just says make sure that you put equal parts. And if you're, say, a filmmaker and you've got extra interviews, you can make content by simply taking extended interviews or scenes that didn't make it into the documentary and putting that up there. Or posting some excerpts from transcripts with some comments leading in and out. Or take a comment that somebody responded and write a whole new article in response. Rarely do I reply to comments. Instead, I'll take a good comment and write a new blog post in response to it and use that as an idea, figuring that if nothing else, I responded to one person, but chances are I helped a few thousand more. So if you've got a customer support department or a place that gets inbound messages, you're getting messages from the community, start turning those into blog posts or FAQs or content that people can see or consume. All right, did all that make sense? Any questions on anything that's been said so far? Okay. One thing to realize is this concept of information gatekeepers. I bring this up because so much has changed. 150 years ago, Western Union controlled 90% of all communication that was done electronically. What does Western Union do now? Money wire transfers, right? Helping people get money to other people who have no way to receive payment. 1947. 97% of all radio was one of four networks. That wasn't that long ago. 1969, the nightly newscast had 50% of all homes tuning in at the same time. I remember my grandparents every time after dinner sitting down to watch the evening news followed by Wheel of Fortune, followed by Jeopardy, and then the TV would go off. And that pattern would repeat every single night. People don't do that anymore. 1997, half of all homes got it through AOL. AOL is a local company here. There are still a lot of people on dial-up, and AOL has now become a content company. They own Huffington Post and a bunch of other properties. Their whole goal is to serve up content off of all of those servers that they already paid for, and monetize it with ads and click-throughs to product sales. AOL is a giant content-based marketing company doing clickbait in sales with a pretty thriving dial-up business, believe it or not, still. Do any of you work for AOL? Okay. 
Do any of you disagree with that assessment violently? Well, 20 years ago, they had half of all internet access. 2002, Internet Explorer had 97% of the worldwide market share. Not anymore. And now, Amazon is selling 63% of all books bought online and 40% of all books. And in fact, that number has gone up because now they own Ingram, which is the distribution company that sells 80% of all of the books that get sent to physical bookstores. Amazon.com, when you think you're buying a local book from a local bookstore, you are ultimately buying it from a store that bought it from Amazon.com and marked it up. So, think about that. A lot has changed. The gatekeepers keep removing. So, I want what I want when I want it has been, this pretty much started in the 80s, right? This pretty much symbolizes what the 80s were about. Being able to get what you want. And the 90s went right into this, right? Self-centered media. Like it or hate it, the 80s and the 90s led to self-centered media. Give me what I want. Cable television. USA Today with shorter news stories. People Magazine. Booming. Websites. All of this. Now, this decade has evolved to I want what I want, when I want it, where I want it. People are no longer happy to say, I can only get this TV show on your network at this time. I have an Apple TV. I've got the, net, uh, I've got the Fire Stick from Amazon. I still pay my cable bill, but I don't use cable at all. I use cable to unlock all of the on-demand internet channels on my television. And so between those and the DVR, I can't think of the last time I watched live TV watch something happen live. Can anybody these days schedule their life around when their TV show airs? Some, very few. So we are still in just as much of the self-centered media stage, but you have to realize that your traffic needs to go where people want it. All right, so very quickly online, you will meet a target audience if you deliver content that they want. Decide who your target audience is, what they need, and only publish that. I know that sounds dumb, but that is the secret to success. Photo Focus has gone for 18 years because we only write about photography. The business of photography, the inspiration, the techniques, that's all we write about. We don't just say, oh, there's a brand new MacBook Pro, here it is. When we talk about the new HP laptops, we position them and talk about it under the idea of, what technology does a photographer need? Oh, do you know you should get a better GPU because this is what Photoshop does? Oh, did you realize that putting in an SSD in your computer will speed up processing photos this much? It's all from a point of view. This is where you have to be careful. Do you know who comments on things the most on your website? People who love you, people who hate you, and really intelligent people who like to have conversations who you should know. You have to figure out what three they fall in. Psycho, psychophant, or useful. And you have, to be, you have to be polite to the ones who love you and thank them for their love. You have to determine if these people are influencers or constituents that you need to engage and you need to ignore the crazy ones. This is one of the best parts about online that people forget. Do you guys ever use meetup.com? It's not a dating service. Meetup.com, fantastic thing. People sign up for what they're interested in, and then local events pop up when there is get-togethers. We have been having photo walks around the country in different cities, and we just connect with people, and they, I'm into photography and photo walks. Great. We're redesigning our website to have a whole meetup calendar. So user groups. There's user groups having meetings here tonight for other stuff. People online would love the opportunity to have real-world engagement, especially if it's local and it doesn't mean I have to fly to a conference and get an airplane ticket and pay for things. People want to meet in the real world. Don't give out your home address. Avoid these people. The people who want to prove how smart they are and disagree with you, just avoid them. Avoid these people. And these are the worst. 
These are the ones, the passive aggressive people who will go to your website and click the one star button on every single article that they can do for 50 articles in a row. And you look at your logs and you realize the same IP address just went click, 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 because you pissed them off about something and they hate you. These are the ones that will trash talk you and you just cannot engage them. You cannot outsmart a troll. If you kill a troll, it will come back to life. There is nothing you can do other than not give them the satisfaction of responding so they get bored and they go look for somebody else to talk to. Ignore them, okay? I said this to you before. When they can choose, people do business with people they like and respect. This is the key to connecting with your audience. Be likable, be respectful, and treat people the same way that you would if you were having a face-to-face -face conversation. All right. Now, not everybody loves the internet. A couple of you were talking about you were concerned whether or not these people really are online. Are they accessing on their phone? <clears throat> um, we'll talk about mobile more in the next class and mobile access. So we're going to go into some of those strategies. Pew Internet Life and the Infinite Dial are two great places to track that information. But here's the people who say the internet is the most important thing in their lives. Not medium, let's be clear. Most important medium, the way that they get messages. Well, that's pretty sizable growth, isn't it? We're seeing a nice jump of about three to five points a year where people are saying, yeah, it's not radio, it's not TV, it's the internet. The internet is the most important way people get news, information, entertainment. Now, when you break that down, <coughs> you can see that there's a pretty big shift, okay? So this is the change over the last 10 years. Additionally, this is if it's a major story. So this is interesting. Newspapers are screwed. Nobody goes to newspapers for news anymore. They go there for coupons. They go there for in-depth coverage if they're smart. Newspaper journalism is some of the best journalism on the planet. The problem is nobody likes to read. As a person who's written 40 books, I can tell you nobody is left on this planet who likes to read. You can't make jack money off of books anymore. People want to be spoon-fed. They want you to give them a video. They want to sit there and think that if they just sit there and watch this in real time, that it will magically stick in their brain. As opposed to if they read it and had to keep reading it until it made sense and had to process it and think about it and visualize it themselves, they would actually learn it better. Now, I'm being hypocritical. We make plenty of money doing online video. And for those of you who watch my online video, I do appreciate it. And there are certain things, like I can't teach people how to edit video in a book. I can teach you about features, but I can't teach you how to edit to music by reading a book. It's hard to teach time-lapse photography reading a book. It's much easier to watch a live event. Music. The internet is more important than radio. What's YouTube's biggest venture right now? Music. Vivo is a YouTube thing. This is the only place YouTube is profitable, by the way. The only way YouTube makes any money is off of their music division. Having those click-through ads at the bottom to go buy the songs where they share the money at the Google Play Store. You upload your video to YouTube without music, and then you find the music that you cut to, and you click a button, it simultaneously streams it underneath, and the artists get paid a streaming fee, and it runs a banner to go buy the song, that's how YouTube is doing it. That's how all that copyrighted music is up on YouTube. It's actually legal if you do it the YouTube way. Now, you can still get sued if you use it for commercial use. That's not a blank check to use it for commercial use. But all those people doing personal projects with copyrighted music, that's how they do it. So people are saying that the internet is pretty important. The younger the audience, the more important it is, okay? And here's the one that I find fascinating. Would they get rid of their television, right? 58% of people said they would get rid of their TV. And people on the iPhone are less sure about giving it up. So, but yeah, six out of 10 people would kill their TV before their smartphone. They would watch video on their smartphone and just get rid of the television if they had to choose. 
You're allowed to take one to the desert island. What would you take? Internet connected TVs are booming. That's one year growth of almost 10%. So it's pretty good. But 15% of all Americans do not use the internet. And 9% don't use it at home. They have to use it at work. They think the internet doesn't matter. They're not interested. They don't need it. They think that it's not easy to use. It's too dense. It's hard to find things. And they're worried about spam, spyware, and hackers. This all comes from the Pew Internet Life Project. It's a nonprofit. There's a full report up there. It's fascinating. There are a lot of people who are freaked out. They say it's too expensive. They don't have access. So you have to realize that if your organization has moved to a pure internet strategy, you are giving up 20% of your audience. 20% of all people don't use the internet or choose not to. Seems weird in this day and age to all of you probably, but you have to realize, and I say this to people all the time, what's your traditional media plan? Oh, it's all digital. Shouldn't be. Now, some things that matter. A lot of people have profiles. This is huge by age. So 80% of all people are on social media. You need to be on social media. And the usage just keeps growing. This is active usage. 73% of people check their social media daily. So if you look at that, you can see the growth over time. Facebook can't get much bigger. 71% of all Americans use Facebook. Not internet users, all Americans over the age of 13 for Facebook's terms of service use Facebook. You know, the world doesn't need any more Starbucks, right? Starbucks is one. Facebook is one. It will be a long time, and they will probably never be unseated. Have any of you read the book Ready Player One? Read that book. Fascinating. It's a science fiction story. But the basic premise is a social network engages in having virtual reality, and the entire world essentially shuts down as people live lush, incredible online lives by the rest of society just goes to shit. And this book was written about seven, eight years ago. Oh, Facebook bought Oculus Rift and is putting all of its effort into VR. You know damn well, as soon as most people can experience virtual sex on the internet, that they will not be going out to clubs and nightclubs, that they will not be doing this other stuff. We already have Amazon that you can just order your groceries and they deliver it to you within three or four hours. People will stop leaving their houses. They hardly, they already have, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. If you live in New York or San Francisco, you could seriously never leave your home. People will deliver everything. You can hit a button and someone will come walk your dog for you. Seriously. It is fascinating how this is. So, this stuff is important. And as you look at it, remember, humor, education, and music are the leading categories for online content. Okay? So, now, these are people who've heard of a platform. What's scary is how much brand awareness Twitter has compared to the uses that they have. Everyone hears Twitter and tweet, and they get this, and they see the hashtags everywhere, and every news outlet uses it. But when a new user goes to Twitter, they're freaked out because of the shorthand and the jargon and the short messages, and it seems rude. So if you have an audience on Twitter, assume this. They are some of the smartest, most active, most engaged people in your network. Use them, motivate them, treat them as the special ones. Anybody's grandma can like you on Facebook. Someone who follows you on Twitter actually cares about you or your brand and is keenly interested. This is an important distinction. Our Twitter numbers are our most effective numbers compared to our Facebook or any other platform. So that's the one that you should engage. But they only are the 4% most used network. It's really weird that there's such a gap. Right? The scary one there is look at Instagram. Who owns Instagram? Facebook. 
who will probably end up owning Pinterest, Facebook. So there's Google+. Plus. So it's gotten pretty interesting. So on your social network, people are overwhelmed by changes. Here's a simple trite overview of things to think about, but this is a joke, but it's kind of, it's kind of actually accurate, which says, you know, do you want anybody to see it? No, good, put it on Google+. Uh, are you at a bar? Yes, okay, put it on Foursquare. Is it business? Yes. Is it personal? Yes. Would it be awkward? Yes. Don't post it. No, it's not awkward. Okay. Are you addicted to likes? Put it on Facebook. Are you not addicted to likes? No. Put it on Twitter because it actually gets results. Is it boring? Put it on LinkedIn. So, Now, I use LinkedIn quite effectively. LinkedIn is now one of my biggest clients. I just wrote an article that you should all read about how I actually use LinkedIn to get business. But it's funny. LinkedIn is all about staying connected and it's a, a, it's a suit and tie kind of business network. Not a, a run free. It's a, here's an inspirational article. Here's a, an opinion piece. It's op-ed. It's journalism and op-ed and networking. Facebook is not. But this actually summarizes it pretty well. So you got these outlets and then you also have creators networks. So if you're trying to get people to be creators or get user generated content, go to places like Vimeo, YouTube, Flickr, Pinterest, and Instagram. This is where the creators post. Run a photo contest on Instagram, not on Facebook. So people need to understand how all those pieces come together. And here's your numbers for utilization. Now, these numbers will vary depending upon the survey. This is from a conservative group. They estimate that Facebook is actively used by 62% of all people. This is Pew. Other groups put it as high as 71. But this is still pretty important to see where it all flushes out. Google Plus, according to this study, is number four. But remember, this is active use. All right, let me jump forward. You can find more of that over at um, Pew Internet Group and the uh, Infinite Dial. So people want to join communities. So there's that uh, Premier Pro community, 6,900 members now. Professional group, managed group, you have to ask for permission to join. The rules are posted right up top. If you are rude or you break the rules, we warned you once. You break them again, you're kicked out. We don't allow people to post their demo reels or here's this cool project I worked on. Would you like my film or give me feedback? No. This whole group is for professional video professionals answering each other's questions about how to get more done in Premiere Pro. It is a highly targeted group. Vice presidents of the company hang out and interact with their members. Um, Photofocus, closed group where people post their photography and respond versus a Google Plus page where people can get all the stories, right? You got to balance that out. We have a private group just for our authors as well. People want privacy. If people feel like you don't respect your community's privacy, they get really freaked out. Don't make everything public. Allow comments, allow email feedback. Don't make everybody post everything. Now, I believe in a real name commenting policy. I don't participate in any forums, and I tell all of our clients, don't have forums where people aren't required to sign up with their real name. Because these are little hate breed communities. These are where people are rude to each other. I believe if you have something mean to say, you should be willing to put your name on it. If you're not, then you shouldn't open your damn mouth. So... People are concerned about government access. So you have to be very careful. Don't ask for excessive amounts of people's information. If you are putting stuff behind walls for people to register to get to, don't wonder why you're not getting views. Make stuff as public and accessible as possible and then reward them for signing up for things with like newsletters or free downloads or you enjoyed this video, get the classroom education kit, click here for your classroom. Don't require the teachers to sign up first to get the content. Make it freely accessible. 
and then make the extra resources, the bonus content, the free ebook, the download, the Photoshop actions, the contest, be the thing that people offer up their information for. I find it takes 10 to 20 times of giving people good free stuff before they will even give you their email address. So if you've built up a wall around your content, it doesn't work. Does everybody understand that message? Because that's another one of those, you must incorporate this or you will fail messages. All right. Um, here's a funny one. 64% of all people think the government should be regulating advertising. That's a pretty big swing, isn't it? That advertising has gotten so out of hand that 64% of the people think that the lies are so bad that the federal government should be regulating things. I'm sorry, I live in D.C. There is nothing that I think 64% of Americans should agree on that needs more regulation other than campaign reform. So, uh, here's a, do any of you guys ever participate in Yik Yak, even as just a voyeur? Have you heard of this? This is a fascinating tool. This is an anonymous tool where people can have a free stream of thought. It doesn't work by schools anymore. High school, only colleges does it work. They've now geo-blocked it so that people can't be stalking kids or getting into anonymous conversations with minors, which was good. They didn't used to have that, which was just downright scary. But it's for college-age kids and young professionals, and it doesn't let you take screenshots. Like, you try to invoke a screenshot, it blocks it. You can still take one camera out and shoot the screen, but you can't screenshot on the device. If people feel you're bullying they'll kick you off the network and block you permanently. So, people upvote their stuff. So we were at Mass and Nutton over a holiday weekend and I screen captured some stuff that people were saying, right? It's amazing how many people are into drugs, by the way, these days. <laughs> Absolutely fascinating just how many people are into drugs or say they're into drugs and how many people would like to have anonymous sex. But that aside, it's funny what people are talking about. Would all the adults go to bed so we could play Cards Against Humanity? You know? I looked at some of my own school. You know, like I logged into my own campus and just seeing what people are talking about. It's interesting because it's one of the few places on the internet where po people can post anonymously and the community votes up what they think is important or they find funny or like. The only other thing like this, which is scary, is Tinder. But there, they're doing it with people. But this is fascinating to see what is on a target demographic's mind. So you want to target college-age students? Go to some college campuses and just sit down for lunch and pull out Yik Yak and watch what people are talking about. It's fascinating. You will get exposed to all sorts of things, not all of them good. You have to have a filter and some self-control. You have to remind yourself that some people are just showing off. But it's interesting. And so this anonymous internet is growing in popularity. And that's why we have private communities. Communities where we have rules. Communities where in our forums, if somebody is rude, they get warned publicly. And if they don't understand that they can't attack other members, they get kicked out. And that's why the quality of our membership in our communities is so high, because we tightly moderate them. Adobe wants me actively involved in their forums. I said, until you give me the power to block somebody from the forum permanently, I will not be involved. Well, we can't block our customers. You know, they're our customers. You know, we have to listen to it. I said, that's great. Would you let them stand in your lobby and swear obscenities about what you know, goddamn crooks you are and this Creative Cloud Pen and this and that and you're stealing this and you're doing that? Would you let them throw a tirade in your front lobby? No? Then why do you let them do it in your chat rooms? Let that person send you an email that you choose to respond to or not. But why do we keep giving idiots a public platform? If you want to see the worst example of idiots having a public platform, read the comments on YouTube. All of you who have YouTube channels should set your YouTube channels to moderated comments where you can go in and have to approve any comment before it goes live. That way, 
you can go in and respond to the good ones and take the other ones off. If you don't have the bandwidth to do it, then you should go in at least three times a week and delete things. I had to show to one of my clients the other day that one of the comments, the number one comment that had the most snarky likes that at the bottom of his marketing video, it said, way to go. If you were trying for the creepy child molester look, you nailed it. And they were like bashing him as a person. And it was the thing right below the video for his company's marketing material. We had another client using YouTube to distribute their videos before us, who I said, would you please just pay the $200 a year for Vimeo? Well, I don't know, it's not that much. Blah, blah, blah. Look at this. What pops up at the end of the YouTube video for your competition? Your videos. What pops up at the end of your videos? Your competition's videos. All these related videos pop up all the time. So as soon as you've caught a customer, what does it say? Oh, stay on YouTube and watch this other thing. YouTube is not at all about driving traffic to your website. It is about keeping people in the orb of YouTube for as long as possible, seeing as many ads as possible. So if video is part of your medium, don't use it. Yep. Oh yeah, they, they, that doesn't mean... <coughs> so, what I do there is I still put stuff on YouTube, but the video that you embed on your website is on Vimeo, because there it's not about pulling people off of your website. And that's the one I'll put in my social media links. It's like saying, well, Walmart wants to carry my products. You're not going to say no, but Walmart's gonna beat you up to where you're making three cents profit per unit. You still wanna have your own stores and control things and be in charge of your distribution. YouTube is a bully, a very, very big bully who loses money all the time, who wants to just make more money. It is not a public service. Remember, did you pay anything to put stuff on YouTube? Yes. So go there if you need to. User-generated communities are also great ways to connect with your audience. Setting up pages, posting stuff to Creative Commons, participating in groups like Creative Cow if you're in the media, uh, Scribd to share eBooks and put your content up, uh, LinkedIn with SlideShare. You cannot believe the insane traffic I get by posting stuff to SlideShare. There's an entire community of people that love to watch PowerPoint presentations. Click through at their own pace and control the flow of information as opposed to watch a YouTube video. And you know what? The number of grad school degrees and advanced degrees is much higher on LinkedIn than on YouTube. So think about that. And podcasts are incredibly relevant. So realize what is happening on all of these networks. And this is the mistake that people make. They think that they have to have their stuff everywhere. No, you don't have to have your stuff everywhere. You have to have your stuff in at least five or six places. And ideally, you'll do bounce back marketing, which is you'll release it in staggered waves so that it moves from network to network at different times. It does no good to send out a tweet, a Facebook post, a Google Plus post, and a blog post all at the exact same time. Hey, look at me, I'm gone. Stagger those, put the blog post out, send the tweet an hour later, put the Facebook thing up four hours later. And with tools like Hootsuite, you can absolutely schedule those and have your RSS feed, which we'll talk about more next, drive that and automatically trigger things. We'll talk about that in the next session. So just important stuff to think about for that content. All right, let me jump forward. So uh, this is Data Never Sleeps 2.0 from Domo. You can find that infographic, but it gives you a nice idea of what's happening. So what do you need to think about? Well, you need to think about how often are you going to post? 
So search engines look for regularly scheduled content. 95% of the time, we publish on PhotoFocus at 6 a.m. Pacific, 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 2.30, and 6.30. I'm sorry, 4.30. Content comes out at the same time almost every day. Search engines love regularity. Content that's regularly published, they love. And it doesn't have to be that often. If it's going to be only once a week, publish on the same day. My own blog is in miserable shape. I have been bombarded with some new business opportunities that I'm working on, and I'm behind schedule on my own website. But my main blog, that's not my personal blog, is very much up to date. And for that, it just becomes important that you publish consistently. You can schedule things in advance so that they come out. Don't get all excited and blog at 10 o'clock at night and hit publish. Schedule it to come out the next morning when more people can see it. And so that's what we'll do. Oh, the podcast came out. Let's send out a tweet that goes to the podcast. Oh, let's send this out. Sometimes we'll even do double click throughs. Oh, hey, this new podcast came out, but instead of sending you to Apple's site to get it, I send you to mine where it's embedded in the web page. I constantly try to pull people into my website, not YouTube's, not iTunes, not Vimeo. Stop being lazy. Don't send people to the YouTube page of your video. Embed that YouTube video or Vimeo video on a page on your website as a blog post. Does this make sense? We've gotten lazy and we are dramatically making it harder to find our stuff. Because those other websites re-index all the time. It is so much more likely for people to find your YouTube video if it's on your website. You want to know why? Because your website has more juice for your name and your brand. So it'll show up better. Now, when you write, a couple of things. People don't read. They scan. This is not the inverted, uh, this is definitely the inverted pyramid model of traditional journalism. Put the information first. Don't build up to a humorous, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. Don't build up to a humorous anecdote that you end on. You're not telling a story and trying to be funny. Consider yourself lucky if they make it to the end. We put call to action at the end. You made it here. What do we want you to do next? Read this next. Get this here. Do this now. Join us for this. But my philosophy, and we'll talk about this. Google is crazy in my opinion. They consider if somebody spent less than two minutes on your website that that person was a bounce, right? Oh, they didn't find what they looked for and they left. They count all these things as bounces. My site has an incredibly high bounce rate. The average read time on my site is about a minute 40. Why? The vast majority of my content can be read in less than two minutes. Why is that good? Because it's really easy to read on one of these. And then they get to the bottom, they can click the link to go to the next part of the story or read the next article that's related. Assume that your audience is reading over their lunch break on their phone or at a coffee shop. Assume that they don't have a lot of time. And it's better to leave them wanting more with links at the bottom to see more. Don't do a 10-part article on the 10 gifts to give this thing. Do each one as a separate post and then release a summary post that says, here's the 10 top gifts for the holiday season. You know, name, one sentence description, link to story. Name, one sentence description, link to story. Does that make sense? A summary story. This goes so much better than putting in too much information. So... I am finding that articles in the 200 to 450 range for word count do a lot better. Stop writing epic correspondence. Short to the point. Avoid excessive jargons and acronyms. And if you don't know your audience, assume that they are a seventh grader. Now, 
If your audience is higher end, you might know that. If you are a scientific institution, you might know that. If you're targeting teachers and that's your primary audience, well, you're going to assume that they probably have a bachelor's degree. But let's be honest. Just because I have a master's degree, do I enjoy reading things written at a master's degree level? No, that feels like work. Now, I don't want to read something that's poor grammar and jargon filled, but I'm fine with anything written like at a freshman high school level. It's an easy read. It's clear. It's to the point. If you ever want to be brought back to reality, hand your article to a kid or to a college age kid or a high school student and read this. Say, hey, I need you to read this. And then don't stand right next to them. Step back a little bit and watch when they look away, how many seconds it takes before their eyes leave the screen or the piece of paper. That's where it's important. So make everything shorter. I have written 40 physical print books. I don't do physical books anymore. I do eBooks. I don't do epic websites. I do short blog posts. And what used to be a blog post is now a tweet. Hey, here's this cool new thing, boom. Hey, I found this great new tool, check it out. Later, I might write a blog post on it. But I will put out 10 of these for every one of these. We will put out six of these a year, but we put this out four times a day. Does that make sense as a mix goes? The easier content you should be doing more often. Don't write a book and then spend two years trying to promote the book and wonder why you haven't sold the book. Write every single day. Put great stuff out there. Collate your best stuff into books and people who like your stuff will buy it. Do any of you read the oatmeal cartoons on the oatmeal? It's a great website. Go look up oatmeal. If you have any sense of humor or sarcasm, you will love it. These guys put out these great cartoons all the time. And all the cartoons that are free on their website, they bundle into books. All the ones that are funny and do well. And they sell a fortune of books. But not because they made a book and then made a website to convince people to buy the books. Think about that. It takes 20 times of somebody enjoying your free stuff before they will give you their email address. What does that mean before they'll give you $20? We're talking 100 impressions before they'll part with 20 bucks. Now, what Kickstarter has taught us is let the people who love you love you more. So you can let them get passionate. You can tell people you're accepting donations. You can set different price points for different levels. Hey, I'm releasing a book. And I've also got 200 copies that are leather bound with a signature page. And if you'd like, uh, I've got you know uh, five of these available where I'll fly to you and we'll go shoot photos for the day and have dinner together and we give a private photo lesson. People will pay for that. I know a lot of people who are well-known photographers who can't make a living off of their client work anymore because stock photography and other things have driven down the market so much. But they absolutely can do what they love and spend the other half of their time leading private workshops and make their money that they need to to live. So post updates anytime anything good happens. Let me just check the time here. Okay, so my next class starts at 4.45. It's on the same topic in the same room. I'm gonna keep going for a little bit I run just a few minutes over, but if you have to leave, I'm not offended. But this is important. Listen first, help second, market third. Every company and organization I work with starts with market first, help the people who complain second, and then eventually listen and learn from all the people complaining afterwards. Seriously, this is the secret. Now, I told you, like, I can't give you a recipe to success, but this is one of those recipes to success. Listen, help, then after you've done that, you will know what the problems are, you will make content that truly helps people, and then because you truly help people, they will want to help you and give you money or get involved in your cause, organization, or content. Do it this way, please. It really works. 
Always use images. We'll talk more about that next. And if you're trying to make your stuff stick, here's some simple rules. Don't jam a bunch of stuff into your content. Whether it's a video, a blog post, anything, three or less points is a good thing. One primary message is ideal. So what I always say is every piece of web content should be singular in purpose. I tell my writers all the time, the purpose of your article should be one sentence long. Tell me what do I get out of this article by reading it. And then along the way, you can make three points to reinforce that main purpose. Anything more than that, and nobody will retain the information. Okay? And be repetitive. <coughs> Excuse me. Be repetitive. At the end, you always need a call to action. This is something from the days of infomercial. Tell people what to do next. Hey, if you'd like to get involved, please do this. If you enjoyed listening to our podcast, please head on over to iTunes and leave a review. Notice I didn't say, if you disliked our podcast, head over to iTunes and leave a review. Um, hey, you know what? I hope you enjoyed this. Why don't you download the software and give it a try yourself? Here's where to get it. After an interview, where can people go to find out more about you? And I tell my folks, please give people one website. Don't tell me your Facebook page and your Twitter page. Don't say, oh, hey, thanks for joining us. Please follow us on Facebook, like us on Twitter, visit our website, and call us on this phone number. It does not work. Tell people to do no more than two things. You know, if you'd like to get involved and help, please do so. Visit redcross.org or call us at 1-800-GIVE-BLOOD. Right? That's a call to action. Now, research is pretty important. Research your audience and get to know them because they all have baggage, they all have things that they need, and you need to find out what motivates them. I was fascinated, I'm using my website as an example, when we figured out how few truly professional photographers there are, people who make 100% of their living from photography, in the United States, there's about 10,000. That's what Adobe estimates of people who make 100% of their living just from photography. Now, number of people who make some living from photography, much higher. People who shoot events on the weekends or the people you see at the farmer's market who've got pictures up that they're selling that are beautiful and they sell that. And I've got a ton of doctors and dentists and lawyers who I've been on photo workshops for who spend $6,000 to go to Alaska for three days to shoot bald eagles, let alone their own airfare and everything getting there. They're spending like $10,000 for a three-day field trip, which they could never afford if they were actually photographers. <laughs> so it's fascinating. These are some survey tools. Um, SurveyMonkey is quite good. Another one that I didn't list on here that I really like um, is Doodle if you're trying to get people to agree upon something like a date or when to hold a live event. Doodle is awesome because you can offer people a poll of when should we hold this next event and let people vote for attendance. Um, but expect minimal feedback. Most people don't comment. You are going to see that the bulk of people do not comment. Look at your download rates, look at your Google Analytics, look at what goes out and assume that the only comments are from the craziest people and your biggest fans. And hidden within there are going to be a few of those subject matter experts or opportunities or leads. Find the leads. Find the people who are valuable. Praise the people who love you. Encourage them. Be polite. The crazy people, just ignore them. Or apologize and say, I'm so sorry that our stuff isn't a good fit for you. Thank you so much for that feedback. I'll pass it on to the writer. Uh, I'm sorry that our website doesn't meet your expectations. Sometimes I'll even go as far as send them, here's a couple of other websites that are about photography that I enjoy reading. Share my crazies and get them to go someplace else. It's totally okay to fire a customer. But you have to look at comments and see what are happening and what people are responding. Allow people to comment. Questions of the week are awesome. We will run questions, just a single question survey, to better understand our audience. 
and let people vote on things. One of the most fascinating ones that we did lately is less than 40% of our readership said that their next camera was going to be bought from Canon or Nikon which was really fascinating and gives me a lot of great ammunition when I'm talking to other companies that make mirrorless cameras and say, um, time to ramp up the education and the marketing budget. People are winning. So here's the thing. This is what I would say about content and connecting with your audience. You have to accept that there is always somebody who will sell or do whatever it is you're doing for less money. If you want to connect with that audience, if you want to succeed, you can never be about price anymore. Price is never the path to win. No matter what you think, I used to think, oh, there was a certain minimum floor level for video pricing. No, people will price video services and lose money for four years to the point where they're like divorced. Well, I, I thought it was normal to lose some money at first. You know, I, I knew I had to build it up. And then they'll go take a staff job somewhere. And then after like about five, six years, they'll try it again. Same thing happens with photography. People doing work at like the equivalent of $2 an hour. You can't win on price. And there is always somebody better than you. This is one of the hardest parts about going to an online photography community for me seeing better pictures taken at places that I've visited by other people. And there is always somebody smarter. There is always somebody who is better, but they're not you. And what's important is that when you can, people will choose to do business with people they like and respect. People will visit websites because of the writers. On PhotoFocus, we make sure that at the bottom of our author's post, most of them are putting a bio and their photo. And I try to encourage everybody to do that. And they have bio pages. And we play up. Look, we've got 22-year-old kids. We've got 68-year-old retirees. We've got men. We've got women. We've got people of all ethnicities and backgrounds writing because they all love photography. You probably have something in common with one of my writers. You are welcome here. What's funny and what worked for all of this was when I showed some of our very well-known photo writers that they can get better traffic on our website than on their own was because I said, look, it's really simple. You only have to blog two or three times a month, but every day new stories are coming out, pulling people in. And all of these other people who you respect are sharing their audiences with each other. And so strength in numbers. So be real, be nice, and be genuine. And that is the secret to connecting with an audience and keeping them engaged. So this was the sort of motivational part of it. You know, it's definitely challenging. The cloud and a lot of these web services fail. There are way too many social networks to choose from. Statistics and information contradicts itself left and right. But it's all about content. And it's remembering to filter. You don't win by being on as many websites as possible. And not every opinion matters. You have to learn to ignore the crap.